رفتیم امروز روز دوشنبه هست 22 همه فروردی ماه 1401 جلسه دوم حضوری درس زمین آمار هست در قدمت عزیزان هستیم اشارهی داشتیم در سه قبل به مطالبی که در دوازده جلسه مجازی خدمتشون گفته بودیم به منظور ایجاد انسجام، اینتگریتی بین مطالب جلسات وقت و مطالبی که بیشتر کار دیازی داره و بنا داریم که در جلسات حضوری بهش بپردازیم If I want to connect our two days discussion to what we said in our previous lecture, once again I have to state the problem again and then try to arrange for a framework to see how we can solve this problem. Given a single partial realization of a random function Then we are asked to estimate the attributes and the consideration at the point which is not sampled. Please pay attention that in various textbooks written on geostatistics, this y upper case letter is denoted by z. And this argument here is denoted by u. And when you are reading a typical text written on geostatistics, you have to connect. You have to interchangeably use z instead of y, u instead of z. Even I would suggest to replace the notation in our own notation and try to reproduce what is given in a typical text. And this is very unfortunate, I would say, that one obstacle toward effective and efficient learning is that different textbooks written on the same subject use different notation. And this is very unfortunate. I do have a justification for y instead of z because z lowercase letter and uppercase letter seems the same on the board if not on the written in textbook. That is why I will use y for representing a typical random function or random variable and then since the space starts with s I will use S instead of U. These are our data. And then we would like to estimate Y at the point which is not sample. In first province, we have 163 non-recording ranges. Which means our province is the fourth province around the country in terms of area. Which means that it is not possible to monitor precipitation at every point in a space, but only 163 ranges. That is what we mean by partial. Because we cannot monitor the entire study area using recording and non-recording ranges. And by single, we mean we have only one number at every point. Even though we represent the attribute under consideration by the uppercase letter. We 
if you if I want to be correct, I have to represent this file by lowercase letter because we have on demand number. But because our framework is stochastic, we deliberately represent Y by uppercase letter to tell you that we are working within a stochastic framework. These are our data. And then we have to go through three steps <coughs> to solve this problem. The very first step is to understand our data. By understanding our data, we mean we have to clear our data, we have to delineate direction of maximum continuity and minimum continuity, which means we have to decide whether we want to consider our random function to be isotropic or anisotropic. We have to decide whether our mean is constant or variable. We have to decide whether our variance is constant or variable. And you know for sure that as soon as you make a decision on your data, you have a clear picture to go ahead and solve this problem. And this is again another part of the unfortunate part of the story is that if you are given a series of data like this problem, you cannot say beforehand which estimator will give you the best goodness of fit criteria. You cannot say that. You have to go through the process, you have to solve the problem, find the goodness of fit criteria, and then tell your audience which estimator is going to be the best. Step one, exploratory spatial data analysis. The acronym for Exploratory Spatial Data Analysis is simply the first letter of these four words. Exploratory Spatial Data Analysis. If you have a chance to work with RTIS as a typical module in this software, then you can find a huge document on exploratory spatial data analysis, RGIS. When I was working on this software at 90, the name was not RGIS, the name was ArcInfo. And I have to use a module so called GRID to delineate depressional areas versus non-depressional areas using grid module of art info. That is the first step. And for the last 10 years or so, our major contribution in uh, geostatistics concerned with this exploratory spatial data. I will try to share uh, a number of papers written on exploratory spatial data analysis with you to see what do I mean by saying our contribution concerned with exploratory spatial data analysis. And we do have a large number of unanswered questions in this case, for which even myself have no answer at the moment for exploratory spatial data analysis. The second step is 
which is very applicable from now up to the end of the course, these three steps. Variography, or a structural modeling, or variogram modeling. Three names. Variography, or a structural modeling, or value in our model. Are you changing the camera as I well move from here to here and so on? Or just it is fixed? No. Are you changing it? Okay, so it's okay. Oh, no. Step three, as soon as you have the model of spatial variability at your disposal, you are ready to go for estimation. Step three. When you see a topic like step two, the very first question that might hit your attention is this. In Mr. Robin, in your previous lectures, you argue that we have two measures to quantify a random function. Measure of similarity, measure of variability. And when it comes to measure of similarity, we have two index. Covariance function, correlation function. When you are talking about measure of variability, that is the index corresponding to measure of variability. The question is, why do we talk about variable and not covariance function? Why do we write step two as variable modeling and not covariance modeling. This is a very important question and you have to have a clear answer for this question. Why do we prefer variable as measure of variability over covariance or correlation function as measure of similarity? We consider two important reasons to prefer variogram compared to covariance or correlation function. What are those two reasons? If you look at the definition of covariance, by the way, in my previous lecture on Saturday, I wrote the definition of covariance function between two random variables. If I want to switch from statistics to geostatistics, again, I do have the same definition for covariance with minor change in notation. Look at the minor change in, rota in notation. That is the covariance. And then I have to write a random variable here. Instead of writing x, I will write x, y as a function of s, i. And you know for sure that y and s, i imply that you have a random variable. Because even though I did not write omega, but omega is in place. Therefore, this is a random variable. And then, y and s, j, is another variable. We have two random variables in a space. 
and this arrow on top of S implies that it could be 1D, 2D, or 3D. When you are in geostatistics, you could replace this by R as a function of S I S J. Which means by now your covariance is a function of absolute location. If you want to quantify your covariance at this stage, you have to specify six arguments for R to be quantified. What are those six arguments? If you are, of course, in 3D. Three arguments for SI and three arguments for SJ. That is what I mean by R being a function of absolute location. And then how we are going to define it Expected value of y at si minus m at si y at sj minus M at SJ. Please look at how I consider writing. I have to start with this and then this and then this. And that is the correct writing, the correct way of writing when it comes to various sign for honoring first parentheses and then bracket and then upper. As you can see, and this is the unfortunate way, that your covariance definition is M dependent. It depends on M, M mean function. And no doubt, if you switch to covariance correlation function, then correlation function between two random variables is i and via SJ can be written as rho as a function of SI SJ. And then we define correlation function in statistics or geostatistics by Because it is a variance, not a standard deviation. And you 
have to raise it to the power of 1 over 2 to make it consistent with the numerator in terms of unit. This covariance function lies between minus 1 and plus 1. These are measure of similarity, which is very applicable to time series analysis. When it comes to variogram modeling, and I would like to write it here and then tell you the reason that I talk about in my virtual lectures, variance of the first increment uh, is defined as value, two times value. Variance of the first increment is considered to be 2 gamma S I S J. When I am about to explain in some detail the exploratory spatial data analysis, I will try to de derive this relationship for you where this relation is coming from. When we have some number of exploratory special events, so what we have to do is to solve it in as we have to do it as we have to do it. So not to the statistics, but 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 not to the statistics. Now, why do we prefer the variogram over covariance or correlation function? Two reasons. First reason. Definition of diagram is M3. There is no need to know M. As you can see, there is no M in definition of diagram. But when it comes to covariance function or correlation function, it depends upon M. And then you may ask, what is wrong? What is the problem with knowing or not knowing M? The question, as I said in my previous lectures, if you want to prove stationarity, stationarity cannot be proved. Stationarity is the property of your model, not the property of your data. You will impose stationarity on your data. Why? The very first condition for stationarity is that M has to be independent of spatial location. M has to be constant. How could it be possible to prove that M is constant when you have only a single number at every point in space? If you have a single number at every point in space, then it is not possible to talk about expected value of this value. Or expected value of this value. Therefore, stationarity is considered to be the property of your data. Again, when I'm talking about exploratory spatial data analysis, I will give some graphical representation to tell you what do I mean by constant, mean variable, mean constant variance, variable variance in more detail. The second reason for preferring variogram over covariance or correlation function. The second reason is more or less theoretical. Why is it theoretical? Today I am going to solve a typical example where I will refer to this second reason as well. Look at this problem. If you realize that your random function is not stationary, and I will I remember I invite you to look at a number of reference like Kitandis or Guarets to see if covariance is defined for variable B. And you realize that in Kitandis, 
the derivation of creating for variable mean assume that the creating system is written in terms of residual, not in terms of the original random function, which means that if you decompose the random function into two components, deterministic component and stochastic component, then Keaton is assumed that your stochastic component is stationary. And then as soon as you assume that your stochastic component is stationary, then you can test your creating system in terms of covariance of stochastic there. But if your stochastic term is not stationary, then you can't talk about covariance function. Now, in Persian, we have an idiom telling you, har gir du If your random function is stationary, then it is intrinsic as well. But if your random function is intrinsic, then it is no longer stationary. A stationarity would give rise to intrinsic hypothesis. But intrinsic hypothesis cannot be given rise to stationary. If you have a stationary random function, then you can cast your creating system in terms of either variable and or covariance function. But if your random function is not stationary, you can only cast your creating system in terms of variable. If I want to put this second preference in another terminology, I would say if you have a process where the random function corresponding to that process is not stationary, then you can still solve this problem, but not with covariance function or correlation. But only with variable function. That is the second reason for preferring variable over covariance function. Now, let me stop at this point because every lecture that we are going to cover something, we will repeat the entire course. That is the reason for not concerning ourselves about what we said before because at every lecture we are going to cover the entire material that we are going to teach in this course. Therefore, let me start to solve this first problem that I raised in my previous email. Tell you what the problem is and how we are going to solve it. The problem statement is this. Linear model in Mandy. This question is designed to consider the random function having a linear variable. Let's WR be a set of independent random variable. Let WI be a set of independent random variable 
that H the values of plus one and minus one with equal by the way this question is a typical question given in exam, either midterm exam or final exam or comprehensive exam. Let WI be a set of independent random variables that take the values of plus one and minus one with equal probability.
And then you are asked in the second part of this question that show that y sub n is intrinsic with linear line. If you are given this problem and you want to see if you can solve this problem using what we said from the first session to now, then sooner or later you will realize that you need to know the basics. What are the basics? Basics are coming from statistics, not true statistics. Let me try to interpret the question itself, put it in our mathematical framework, telling you, you have to specify your objective, you have to convert your objective into a conceptual model, and then you have to convert your conceptual model into mathematical model. And then as soon as you have a mathematical model at your disposal, then you are ready to solve. If framework we went on the name, it's an H fellow chart we went on the name, it happened even to each one to course it to call Mandur to Rahat and Mikonam, which one to course Shamali, which one to Das Mashay, Hydrolegimos Bati, Hydrolegimos Bati Kirin Boshe, Riazot Ali Mahandasi Do, Kimozohim Sakra for Nome, Kaiser Sadeshudi. ایتیناتو Give it a try. What does that mean? When I say it will be used in your social life as well. In your social life, you have to have an objective. You have to convert your objective into a conceptual model. And you have to see how you can overcome your life problem. According to the advice received from Einstein, you have to spend 50% of your time on understanding the question itself. And then allocate another 50% on how to solve it. Let me interpret the first sentence. Let WI be a set of independent random variables that take the values of plus one and minus one with equal probability. This random variable, at first we have to decide whether it is discrete or continuous because it will affect our decision on how to solve it. If our original random variable is a discrete random variable, then we have to follow one route. If our original random variable is continuous, then we have to follow another route. Can I give a real example of a typical random variable that behaves like this? Yes, why not? If you throw a coin, The 
result of doing this experiment is either tail or head. As soon as you throw a coin, you have to consider a sample space for the result that you are going to get. That result will make up your sample space. Therefore, if you throw a coin, The typical example or experiment of throwing a coin has either tail or head. If you represent the random variable for this statistical experiment by x, then this x will act on your sample space to give you a number. Therefore, by throwing a coin, you are going to have a sample space. And the sample space for this simple experiment is either H or T. We will denote the sample space by omega, the inherent randomness. This x, this random variable x, will act on omega to give you a number. And if you refer to my previous lecture, under the stochastic number law, I talked about four possibilities. The very first possibility is to have x only a function of inherent randomness. The second possibility is to have x as a function of time and internet randomness. The third possibility is to have x as a function of s space and internet randomness. And the fourth possibility is to have a spatial temporal phenomenon. Therefore, if you throw a coin or if you throw a disk, you are talking about a purely random process where the random variable has only inherent randomness as the exclusive source of variability. And then you will argue that this is positive one if omega is equal to h. And it is equal to minus one if omega is equal to t. That is how we interpret throwing a coin or throwing a disk. All you need to do if you want to see what is this W here, the W out there is simply this X here. And it says let W I be a set of now. What is this independent? This independent concerned with repeating this experiment numerous times. And this will give you W0, W1, W2, W3, W4, W6, and so on. And by independent, it implies that the covariance between WI and WJ is zero. Okay? What I'm trying to do is just trying to interpret the question. This is given and this is fine. This is the objective. Now the conceptual model is this elaboration this interpretation to understand the question itself. How could it be possible to interpret WI for a particular I, of course, is this. All you need to do is to replace this X with W. And then, with equal probability. The probability of uh, having 
probability of having W equal to H is 1 over 2. Probability of W This 
random variable at y n is 2. And then if w0 is 1, but w1 is minus 1, then it will give you 0. Now, assume that this w0 is minus 1. And then change this to what you have for w1. Minus 1 plus 1, 0, which cannot be written again because 0 and 0 is the same. Minus 1, minus 1, that will give you minus 2. These are trivialization for this random variable at y n. Y at n, y at 1, could get either 2 or 0 or minus 2. But y at 0 could take only plus 1 and minus 1. When you are here, you have to see what are the combination for these three values. Plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1. Combine them to see the number of permutations that you are going to take. Is there any other scenario or alternative for this? Can you delineate some other combination? Plus one, this could take the plus one or minus one. For, for plus one, it will give you two, and minus one, it will give you zero. And then you could freeze this by minus one, then this could be plus one and minus one. That will give you minus 2 and 0. 0 cannot be repeated again. Therefore, you have three possibilities for random variable at y n. This is y at 0. This is y at 1. And this is y at 2. And you know for sure that at every point, for the virus virus of n, you are going to have a random variable. Their aggregation will give you a random function. I'm still talking about conceptual value. Now, I have to interpret these two as well. Part of the conceptual model. Or, better to say, moving gradually from conceptual model to mathematical model. If I want to show that my random function is not stationary, I have to know the properties of a stationary random function to be able to show that y sub n is not stationary. I have three conditions for a random function to be stationary. What are those conditions? Condition number one. For a function to be a stationary. The very first condition for a stationarity is to have the expected value of y at generic n to be constant, independent of n. That is the first condition for stationarity. Expected value of y at the typical n, generic n, not particular n, has to be independent of n, index of space or time. The second condition for stationarity is to have variance of y at a generic n to be independent of n. The third condition for a stationarity is to have covariance of y at 
in I and Y at N J these are two random, these are two random variables. The covariance between these two random variables, which can be written in shorthand by R to be a function of N I in J, and there is no need to put arrow on top of this, and you know for sure why, because this must be, there is no need to put arrow on top of it. And for your random function to be stationary, this R should be a function of separation length. These are three conditions for a random function to be a stationary. If you want to show that a given random function is not a stationary, at first you have to check the first condition. If it happens that it will satisfy the first condition, then move to the second condition. If it happened that your random function satisfies the second condition, then you have to move to the third condition. If it happened that the random function satisfies the third condition, then you will say that your random function is second order stationary. Second order stationarity has something to do with this variance and covariance. Okay. If it happened that only one of them is not satisfied, then your random function is not stationary. Here you will notice that the first condition is applicable, but the second condition is not applicable. The second condition cannot be satisfied. Therefore, your random function is not a station. How could it be possible to show that expected value of y is depending on n or not depending on n? You have to refer to basics. You have to refer to definition of your random function. You have to replace this, let me write it again, I have to look at this y with its counterpart. And since this operator is linear, I can bring it inside. Typical 
random variable, if x is discrete, is given by summation j from 1 to n p sub j times x sub j. This is how we define expected value of a discrete random variable. How can I interpret this p sub j and x sub j? As you can see, this x is discrete. Therefore, the sample space corresponding to this x is a numeral. And here, for this particular case, is 2. Because we have two possibilities, plus 1, minus 1. This x of j is the numerical value that x could take. Look at this x here. The plus one or minus one. And then this piece of j is the probability associated with x of j. If the probability for the first possibility is 1 over 2, the probability for the second possibility is 1 over 2, then that means I have P1 and P2. I do have X1 and X2. I can replace them to see what will happen. Now, the question is, if I want to write down an equation for expected value of WI, should I use 1 index or 2 index? If I want to write, if I want to write down this equation, equation for expected value of W I, I have to use two index. What are those two index? Summation J from one to two P sub J. Now look at this X, what happened to this X here? The only change happened to this x is become lower case, which is the realization. Now, I have to convert this w to lower case letter. It will become w. And then I have to freeze i. And then I have to use another notation as j. Therefore, if this i is 0, then this equation will become j from 1 to 2, p sub j, that will be 0 j. If that in, this y is 1, then it will become p sub j, that will be 1 j. If y is 2, then it will become 2 j. Therefore, the expected value of WI according to this relationship is zero. Which means that the expected value of our original random function independent of n is a constant. And that constant is zero. Which means that the first condition for a stationarity is applicable. Now we have to go to the second step to see if the variance of our original random function is independent of n. Again, I'm going to replace
how could it be possible to compute variance of this summation? and tell the audience whether this variance is independent of n or not. What am I going to do because when we are going to use this relation numerous times, I'm going to talk about variance of random variable y in statistics, not your statistics, to be a linear combination of n random value. If I want to connect this to this, I would say here, out here, my a, a sub i is 1. Okay? And x sub i is basically w1. If I can work with variance of y or variance of this summation here, find a, an equation for this case, or a relationship for this case, then I can use it here to find variance of this linear combination. For this linear combination, the coefficient is 1. Variance of y. is basically variance of this linear combination. And then if I want to refer to basics to find the variance of this, I have to use this definition here. Not necessarily this definition, but this definition. Expected value of y at si. This is point, not comma, which means that margin. y at sj minus m at si. N at SJ. This is another way of writing covariance function. If you ask me how did you find this, I would say multiply this by this, simplify it to get that. What happened if I replace this J with I? If I replace j with i, I'm going to get expected by the of y to the power of 2 minus n to the power of 2. Now, here, if you want to use that basic relationship, you would say it is equal to expected value of i from 1 to n a sub i x sub i to the power of 2 this is y to the power of 2 which is equal to this summation minus x to the value of y to the power It is not okay to put two here, right? It is not okay to put two here. Chero?
If you put two here, then expected value would not be raised to the power of two. But this variance of y is equal to expected value of y to the power of two minus expected value of y to the power of two. Here, it is better to first write this. minus this. What I did, at first I write down this volume of y to be this, and then replace this y with what I have. How could it be possible to raise this to the power of 2? I have to expand it first, get rid of the summation, and then raise it to the power of 2. When it comes to this, at first I have to protrude, activate expectation, and then raise it to the power of 2. Therefore, let me see what will happen. Expected value of... I have to expand this and then raise it to the power of 2. It will become a1 to the power of 2, x1 to the power of 2. plus a2 to the power of 2, x2 to the power of 2, plus an to the power of 2, xn to the power of 2. And then I have to time two times, first times the second. Therefore, 2 a1, A2, X1, X2. Do you know what I'm doing right now? Just one of the identities in high school. Plus 2 times A1, A3, X1, X3. And so on. I expand this from y equal to 1 to n and then raise it to the power of 2 to get that. When it comes to this part, I have to first activate this expectation on xi, expand it and then raise it to the power of 2. What would be the first sentence? A1 expected value of X1 to the power of 2. It will become A1 to the power of 2 and then expected value of X1 to the power of 2. That is the first sentence. Minus A2 to the power of 2, expected value of x2, then to the power of 2. And then you can generalize this and write a1 to the power of 2, expected value of xn to the power of 2. Then you have n terms here. Therefore, you have to consider 2 times a1, a2, expected value of x1 times expected value of 
expected value of x2. And then, please pay attention that I have to put minus sign here. Why? Because plus or minus sign? No, plus. Because if you take expectation from this, it will become positive, which means that this times this will become positive. And then because this term is negative, this plus sign times this minus sign will become minus. And then you have plus 2 times a1, a2, a3. Again, expected value of x1, x3 minus expected value of x1 and expected value of x3 plus You can replace this with variance of x1, therefore variance of linear combination. Summation 
I from 1 to N, summation J from 1 to N, AI, AJ, covariance of XI, XJ. But please pay attention that for this double summation, I cannot be equal to J. Right? Because these terms are very distinct when it comes to the index. Therefore, you have to keep in mind that for this double summation, I cannot be equal to J. But you may ask what happened to these two here? Can you answer this question? If I represent from here up to what I have by this double summation, what happened to these two? Can I reproduce two from this double summation? Yes. Why? Right? Because I have to keep i equal to two, i equal to one, expand this summation. And then as soon as I will assume that i is equal to two, then again j has to start from one. Therefore, it will create that two from here. Now, could it be possible to combine these two summation and write it as a single double summation? I can write this as I equal to 1 to N I equal to 1 to N A sub I A sub I while the covariance of X I X I Because variance of xi is equal to covariance of xi xi. This is how to replace this single summation with this double summation. And then plus this. If that is the case, then you can combine them. Because here i cannot be equal to j, but here i is equal to j. Therefore, you can combine it into a single double summation writing it as i equal to 1, j equal to 1, ai, aj, covariance of xi, xj. That is how to compute variance of linear curve. And if you took a course like Mr. Miragwadi on advanced linear algebra, yes or no? Yes. Then you can replace this by a quadratic four. Because we are talking about dual statistics, we can say in instead of having this. This x of i is a function of s. For this i is here. If this x is considered to be a function of spatial location, then you can write this as double summation i from 1 to n, j from 1 to n, a sub i, a sub j, and then covariance of x at s i, x at s j. Because we are talking about Jewish statistics as opposed to statistics. And then you can replace this covariance by r. Summation i from 1 to n, 
Exclamation J from M to N. A sub I, A sub J, R sub S I, S J. And then, as I said, from linear advanced linear algebra, you can write this as A as a vector, transpose R as a matrix, R as a matrix, times A. It's a quadratic form. Therefore, variants of linear combination can be written this. And that is what we did in our web virtual lectures. A transpose variance covariance matrix A. Now, that is not our final problem. Our final problem is to see if the variance of y at n, which is this, can be shown to be independent of n or dependent on n. Now, Mrs. Raja, could it be possible to tell me how should I write this variance of this linear combination based on what I have here? I can write this as I from 0 to A J from 0 to N
oil from one to ten. By the way, this oil should go from zero to ten. Because oil is also defined for zero. Or W is defined for I equal to zero. Then we have to put piece of I here and then omega of I I have to put J because I have I here. J I J minus mu W I to the power. That is how to define my variance when I have W R. The numerical value of W mu sub W I is zero. Why? Because we proved that the expected value of W I is zero. Therefore, I'm going to compute this as one over two times plus one to the power of two plus one over two times minus one to the power of two. It will become one. And then when when I am well, I'm here, I have to write this as summation i from zero to n one. And what would be the numerical value of summation i from zero to n? And then the argument of the summation is one. It's going to be n plus y. What happened? Variance of generic random function depends upon n. Therefore, it is not a station. Expected value of WI is independent of n is constant, but when it comes to variance of voice of n, variance of voice of voice of n depends upon n. It should be constant if your random function wants to be a stationary, but since variance of voice of n depends upon n, therefore your original random function is not a stationary. I said, oh, well, are you going to give this as a midterm exam? These are a piece of cake. Now, Seems that we have to stop at this point and leave the remaining to our Saturday session. Okay? As for Selotuan, I have this.